welcome to the art of being human. We've been talking about how people medicate themselves and take care of their own anxiety because the thing that happens to people is when they feel anxious and depressed and nervous, the thing they want is relief from symptoms. They're not concerned so much about the cause of the symptoms. They just want to get rid of the symptoms. They may not want to go to a therapist or to a doctor to help them with symptoms, so they try to do it on their own, to take something or do something that's going to help them relax enough so they can handle it on their own. And that's okay for short term, but it doesn't work very well on long term. And then when you stop fooling around with, with different kinds of things, whether it's medication or smoking or alcohol, whatever it is that you're using, you can get in trouble with that. It's better to get the help that you need to begin with. So we have gone through some of the thing, ways that people self-medicate. What I want to start off with this time is anger. Do you realize that anger is a, an emotion that some people like to have? And the reason they like to have it is that anger is energizing. It makes you feel powerful. It makes you feel like you have a lot of energy. And, but it can also keep people away from you. You know what it is? If you get angry at people and you start yelling and you start screaming, people do not hear what you're saying. All they hear is the anger. That's why screaming at kids never works. I've heard people scream at kids. How many times have I told you blah, 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 and on and on it goes. What does a child actually hear? He hears the anger. He feels the anger. He gets upset by the anger and afraid of the anger. But if you ask them, what was the anger about? What did your mother just tell you to do or not do? They're unclear about it because what they've got is the emotional reaction that they're feeling due to the anger that their parents or whoever it is is, is expressing. But it doesn't give them the message. The way that you get the message across is that you're calm. You, take, you may feel angry in the inside, but you don't show it. You take the child to one side and say, now look, we've discussed this, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. You make them repeat it back to you so you're sure that they've got it. But the yelling and the screaming out. You tell them that you love them, but that you can't allow them to do certain things, and it's for their own safety, and you just leave the anger out of it. Then they can catch the message. They know what you said. You've told them in a calm way. You've asked them to repeat the essence of what you've said. They're able to do that, so you know that they understand what you're saying, or at least for the most part they do, and so therefore they, they get the message. Screaming obliterates the message and instead substitutes the emotion. And what they would understand is, my mom is really mad at me, but the, the details of what she's mad at are lost. They're lost in the anger. But anger is very energizing, and people feel uh, powerful if they're angry. They don't feel weak. If you're anxious, if you're nervous, you feel weak. You feel out of control. You feel like you're vulnerable. But if you're angry, you don't feel that way. There is a link between anxiety and anger. Sometimes they pair up very well together. But the thing is, the anger is always going to be subservient to the, to the anxiety because the anxiety is always going to come back. The anger wins out in the short term, but the anxiety will always come back because what you want to do is get rid of the anxiety. You get angry, you yell at people, and you don't gain anything from that. People don't like you better. If they obey you, it's because they're afraid not to. They're not obeying you out of respect. They're obeying you to keep you shut up. They, they want to tell you, no, don't yell, don't scream, I've had enough of that, this job isn't worth that. They can't come out and say those things. I know that uh, once in a while my mother used to yell at me, and all I could think of at the time, and I was a small child, and not perfect by any ways, but she would yell at me, and I'd, all I'd wanted to do was just to shut up and talk to me. Tell me what I did wrong. Just shut up and talk to me. And that's what I would think. I would never say this. I would never express it to her that way. 
But and and how many times this has happened to so many children that they get yelled at and they get yelled at and they get yelled at. They don't have a clue as to what you're yelling at them, or they may have a general sense of what you're yelling at them, but they're not specifically keep clear. All they live for is to try to avoid the anger. They'll do whatever you say as long as you don't scream, because that's a bad thing to do. It's a bad thing to do anyway. You just never, you just never make any gains by screaming. And adults do it too. They yell at each other, and that doesn't help anything. Do you respect people that yell at you? Probably not. It's just I have to work with this person and he's yelling. But I don't like it. But I don't have a choice. It's either that or get another job or do get into another department. So yelling is just not the way to do it. So in the short term, the person who's doing the yelling feels better. In the long term, it doesn't work. It doesn't have any good positive effects when a nice talk would be doing just fine. So you just have to understand that anger does not stop anxiety. Anxiety trumps out. It really does. Anger and anxiety are linked together. When you are anxious enough and you can't take it enough, a lot of times you resort to anger. Anger does not last. It's, it's fulfilling for the moment. Well, I guess I really told him off. I feel better now that I told him off. But the anxiety will always return. Linked together, the anxiety returns. You know, I remember when I was in college, the people that I respected, the professors that I respected the most, most were the people who always had everything in control. Terrible things could be happening, and a professor would walk in, well, let me see, let's take a look at this. What does this mean? And they'll analyze this, and they'll analyze that, and they'll come to a conclusion, but it didn't seem to affect them emotionally. They never seemed to get upset. Now, a lot of people don't have a lot of emotions that they show, and they do act and try to analyze things. But for the most part, most people are more emotional than they are analytical. We te tend to think, you know, we are a race of people that we can think, we can analyze, we can solve problems, and we place our trust in the ability of the brain to do, just do things, solve problems. But actually, in terms of our emotions, most people react to emotions much more strongly than they react to anything else. We are more emotional than we are intellectual, at least in our expressions. And so what we do is we try to reverse that somehow. We try to be the intellectual person. We'll analyze this. This will be all right. We can take care of it. Because they feel better if they can do that. But the the thing is, it's a matter of control. We try to control things because if we can control things, then what we can do is have an outcome that we want. If I can manipulate everything that's going on around me, then I can have an ending to those things in the way that I want because I can manipulate the ending. I can manipulate how things work out. But the problem is no one's got that kind of control. I can't control whether it's raining out. I can't control whether somebody in my family gets sick. I can't control if I walk across the street and somebody hits me and I break a leg. What kind of control do I have over any of those things? And you don't. So you have to be able to, if you're going to be healthy, go with the flow and be able to uh, access and be able to work through ambiguity. In other words, things that are questionable, things that you can't control, things that you can't plan on. You have to be able to work through those things and not be shaken up by them because then you will be an emotional wreck if you're shaken up by everything that happens to you. Things happen and you just handle it and you go on with it and that's a good healthy way to live but for the most part most people get very very emotional whether they show it or not and they get angry and sometimes that anger isn't masked very well and then they start yelling and they start screaming and then you have a person that you don't want to deal with because they're behaving in that kind of a way and it's not a good way to behave no one trusts you if you do that and no one wants to deal with you if you do that because people want to stay away from anger.
They really want to stay away from anger, and they don't like it when anger is being expressed to them because they're on the hot spot, and there may be nothing that they did. They just may be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and then they get the re then they are the recipient of if somebody else's anger that is misdirected. So if you can't get angry at your boss, and who do you get angry at? Or well, somebody that doesn't have a position like you that you have maybe a little authority over. Over, and then they get your anger. You know, it's like going home because you're angry and upset. So what do you do? You kick the door like the door had anything to do with it. You have to express it. The thing about emotions is that you have to express emotions. And I know that theorists will say every emotion that you experience has to be expressed in some kind of way. And that's probably true. But it doesn't mean that you have to express it in a way that causes other people to want to stay away from you because you're angry all the time. It, it can be expressed in a much more creative way. People who feel stressed like to wash floors, the scrubbing, it gets, the, it gets the anger out. I mean, there are just various things. Some people turn to artwork, some people turn to music, some people turn to writing. There are a lot of ways to express yourself and let those emotions out. But to scream and to yell and to be angry at other people and to continually be angry at them and to yell all the time, whether you have, a, have the right to do it or not, you know, who wants to have people afraid of them? You know, I have relationships with all kinds of people. I like people. I would not want them to be afraid of me because they would be afraid I might yell at them for something. But people who have that habit of coping, and it can be a coping skill, and they're angry all the time and they yell all the time, they feel better in the short term. Meanwhile, they're losing all their friendships because nobody wants to deal with it. Nobody wants to be working with a person who has a hot temper. Because if you have a hot temper, everybody's afraid of the hot temper. And it shows like it always shows. And then people just kind of shrivel up. They may not say anything. They may say, yes, of course. I know you're right. All little statements like that just to be able to calm the person down. But they never get anything out of it. It doesn't help relationships. You never get anything done. If you're angry, what are you doing? You're pounding the table. You're kicking the door. You're yelling and screaming. You may be using words that aren't permitted on television. And yet at the same time, you're not helping yourself. You're hurting yourself because all of those emotions do something to your body. The body doesn't hold emotions, they, it, it expresses them. And so you get this inward aggression and outward aggression. Outward aggression is when you let your emotions out. Hopefully not by yelling and screaming, but that is one of the ways. But there are other ways, too, that are a lot better. Then you have the inward aggression, where you aggress against yourself by being angry. And what happens is those emotions get bottled into your body and actually hurt the way that your body functions. People get ulcers. People get migraine headaches. People get all kinds of things, and part of that can be due to the emotions. Now, it's also true in terms of ulcers that you can have a virus or a bacteria that can also cause ulcers. However, a lot of people get ulcers because their body just can't handle the, the emotions that they are projecting inwardly. They're not expressing them outwardly, so therefore they're expressing them inwardly, and it becomes inward aggression as opposed to outward aggression when people just let those emotions go. So anger is not a good thing. Now there's another thing I want to talk about here, and it's called self-harming. How do you harm yourself? This is something that uh, most people don't pay that attention to. What if you uh, pull your hair out? Some people do. What if you cut yourself? What if you scratch yourself to the point where you have scabs? And then when the scabs come in, you pick at the scabs, the scabs go, and you've got that wound, which has got a scab again, because that's a part of the healing process, and you keep having to take the scabs off, and then there's a little baby, a little blood that comes out of that. That's self-harming. 
Suicide, of course, would be the greatest self-harming, but I'm not talking about it to that degree. Self-harming is when you're pulling your hair, scratching yourself, maybe cutting. Some people cut themselves. They feel an intense amount of relief and release when they do that. That's part of the psychodynamics of it. If you cut yourself, you're, it, symbolically at any rate, you're allowing all of those emotions to snap out of it, just to flow out of it. So it's like you've released a part of the things that hurt you the most, and you did it through the cutting. Now, in actuality, you haven't released anything, but you feel like you have. And so therefore, you keep cutting yourself. Some people have such a habit of cutting themselves that they have to wear long sleeves all the time because their arms are full of scars. And so that's a self-harming device. And it gets to be a coping device because you are, what you're doing is you're letting something in you get out of you through the way of the cut. Now, that's largely symbolic, but that's the way that you feel. You feel if you cut yourself, then some emotions are, are let out because you've opened the doorway, in a sense, to allow them to get out. And that's not good. Self-harming is not good. You can wound yourself, and you feel like you are relieving internal stress when you wound yourself. But you're actually not helping yourself at all. So wounding makes you feel like you're releasing internal stress. And it can also be a self-punishment device. You can hurt yourself and, and aggress against yourself by talking to yourself in a negative way. Have you ever said to yourself, well, I'm stupid. I don't learn very well. And you keep saying things against yourself. You may not do this audibly all the time. You may just do it silently. And uh, you, you think it, but you don't necessarily say it aloud. Oh, I'm just nothing but a stupid person. I can't understand anything. I'm not smart like other people. So what you are doing is you are wounding yourself, wound, wounding your psyche by saying all of these negative things, even if nobody knows it. You're saying all these negative things. You are verbally abusive to yourself. And you feel you need to be punished. So how do you punish yourself? You tell yourself that you're awful. Now, I'm interested in the ministry that people have with prostitutes. And what they will do is they will self-punish because they know that this is not a good line of work to be in. They know they're in danger. They know that it's not moral. And so they feel they need to be punished for being that, for choosing that way of life. So how do you punish yourself? By doing the same thing that you think you need to quit. In other words, I'm heaping punishment on myself with what I'm doing for my life's work. And yet, I have to do it because I need the punishment. And this is the way I punish myself, by doing the very thing that I should stay away from. And the very thing that I'm doing anyway, I keep doing it, and I punish myself for it. So if you are in the process of calling yourself names, doing something that you wish you weren't doing, but at the same time you do it to punish yourself, Cutting hair sometimes is, uh, is that kind of mechanism. Pulling your hair out of a mustache, there is a name for that. There is a special condition where men will just pick and pick and pick and, and uh, lose hair from their mustaches or beards by pulling it out. You know, or hitting yourself. A lot of kids will hit themselves. They'll walk along, they'll take a stick and they're hitting themselves as if somebody else was doing it. And this is the way they have to punish themselves. Now, if you're going to punish yourself by doing something to yourself, either by talking to yourself, which is a form of self-talk, which is in a negative fashion, because self-talk can be used in very positive ways, but you can also use it in negative ways, especially if you're accusing yourself of something. I never was very smart. I never could keep up with the other kids. Why does anyone think that I need to go to college? I know I can't do the work. I know I'm going to flunk out. I know this because this is what is going to happen. I know what's going to happen, and it's all going to be negative. Poor little me. 
And in a sense, it is like a poor little me. But at the same time, the person starts to believe it. I really am stupid. I really don't have intellect. I really don't have a good, clear thought pattern. And what you do is you, you heap just gobs and gobs and gobs of, of punishment upon yourself. And it's a way, believe it or not, of, of medicating yourself. It is, in a way, talking to yourself in a negative way. is a way of self-medication. In what way? Well, they certainly can't expect me to do this or that or the other because I'm just not capable. I just can't do it. If I was smarter, I could do it, but I just can't do this, that, or the other. Don't give me too much responsibility because I can't handle that kind of responsibility. Choose somebody else that's smarter than I am. Now, you, when you're doing this kind of thing, you're making assumptions about yourself. You're making assumptions that you're not good enough, that you'll never be good enough, that you'll never have anything that's be better than what you have now, that you'll probably lose what you have now now. You're always expecting that kind of inward punishment. And the thing is, some people punish themselves because they don't feel like being punished enough. In other words, I've done something terrible and I wasn't really punished. The courts let me go. And so therefore, if no one else is going to punish me, I'm going to punish myself. Now, a lot of this is subconscious. You don't realize that you're doing it, but you are doing it. And as a result of that, it's punishment Punishment, 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 which you heap on yourself as if no one else is going to do it, you do it to yourself. I'm dumb, I'm stupid, or I'm going to pull my hair out and release all of those bad feelings. It's symbolic, but it happens. Or I'm going to cut my hair all the time, or I'm going to pull my hair all the time, or I'm going to hit myself. I'm going to tell myself that I'm stupid. It's all a form of self-punishment. Anger directed back at yourself, not at anybody else, but blaming yourself. And that can be an addictive force in your life. And that you're going to not, not be able to continue to do any good things. If it is, you'll be kind of watching for that to stop and kind of watching for the second shoe to drop. It's very hard to make progress in your life when you are constantly condemning yourself and saying that you're not good enough. The truth is you need to look at yourself and see where you've come from and see what you have done and take pleasure in that and think about that. Well, yeah, I couldn't do this, but look, I can do this. We're going to be getting into, in a future segment, probably the next time we meet, uh, these defense mechanisms that people use when they're under stress and how that hurts them and how that can help them in some ways, but it can also hurt them. And the body just does it. Everybody uses these defense mechanisms. And I have taught them before, but I'm going to go over them again. I can see that we're beginning to run out of time, so I'm going to close it here, and we'll continue with this next time. Please join me then.